We are live. Ain't not Dr. A Nightville. This is a miracle. We're actually live. Thank you so much for being so patient through this whole technology. I always say technology is a blessing until it doesn't work. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> I am truly, really excited to have you in this Women in Politics special interview series that we have started four weeks ago in the Born to Do Business Global community. Uh, as you know, this is a community of purpose-driven women entrepreneurs, mostly Jewish or from Israel, but also from all around the world. And uh, I'm so really thrilled to have you because I've read uh, what you work on. I've listened to your uh, videos and I've really done a lot of research because I think that everything I really I'm in love. I really love it. I love everything you say, everything you, you talk about. And I want to share this with our community. But before I start with amazing questions, uh, that I have for you. I do want to read your bio so that everyone knows who you are for those uh, of the people that are listening uh, who don't know who you are. Uh, is that okay? Of course. Great, thank you. Uh, so a little about Dr. Einatville. So Dr. Einatville was born and raised in Israel and she served as an intelligence officer in the Israel Defense Forces foreign policy advisor to Vice, Prime, to, to Vice Prime Minister Shimon Peres and a strategic consultant with McKinsey and Company. She was a member of the Israeli parliament from 2010 to 2013, where she served as chair of the Education Committee and member of the Influential Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Today, Dr. Wilf is a leading thinker on matters of foreign policy, economics, education, Israel, and Zionism, and she is the author of six books that explore key issues in the Israeli society. And we have a link to all the books if you want to have the list of the uh, very interesting books that Dr. Wilf has written. Uh, Dr. Wilf has a BA from Harvard, an MBA from INSEAD in France, and a PhD in political science from University of Cambridge. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for being with us, Inad. Thank you so much. My pleasure entirely. So I have to say the first question that I'm really uh, impatient to ask, and of course, this is talking, we, we want to talk about women, we want to talk about feminine leadership, we want to talk about women in politics. And the first question I want to ask you is, from your own experience, but also from observing the Israeli society, would you say that there is a difference between a masculine uh, leadership and a feminine leadership? And if there is, how have you uh, experienced it and what can you share around that? Um, I think uh, it's, it's difficult to reflect on it because on the one hand, I experienced life as a woman, but on the other hand, I'm me. Uh, it's always difficult to know how much of my personal experience is uh, general to women, how much of that is personal. Uh, I think at least in my experience in politics was that women tend to be outsiders. Uh, generally, they're a minority in politics, even if the numbers are growing. Uh, women in Israeli parliament, certainly in government, are still a small minority. Uh, certainly in the fields where I was, such as uh, foreign and defense, I was a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Um, I was a minority, a very small one. And I think the experience is mostly of being an outsider. And I would often find that my views were shared with others who were outsiders. So, uh, for example, the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in the Israeli Knesset is mostly, sadly, the Defense Committee, and it's a very testosterone-filled committee. Uh, and, for example, uh, people who did not have security background or intelligence or uh, served in the military, I mean, we all served in the military, but, I mean, like, had full careers in the military, uh, often I found that uh, we had similar outsider views to those who really came from within the security establishment. Uh, so that's certainly something that I saw. And of course, at least to my recollection, our outsider views were often correct, uh, especially the years that I was there were the years of the Arab Spring. Uh, the security establishment got it all wrong. 
And I and the other couple of civilians in the room, we got it right. Uh, we understood that things were changing in a way that security establishment people were unable to see. Um, I remember when I raised uh, more than 10 years ago the issue of delegitimacy, the strategic challenge uh, to Israel that comes from words. And I would get these condescending views from, again, security people from whom, you know, how could words be dangerous? Uh, only things that are metal and shoot can be dangerous. Um, so my experience is really more about the experience of being an outsider, a minority, and thinking different. Okay. And so you would say that any minority or any person that is outsider would feel like a woman? Or would you say that there are specific characteristics to feminine leadership? And I don't mean that feminine leadership is only owned by women. We can have a feminine way of leadership also practiced by men. Uh, but do you feel like women leadership or feminine leadership uh, is different than a masculine leadership? And were you able to yourself bring your voice? Uh, or was it just because it was a minority or an outsider? Or is there something specific about uh, the feminine way of being a leader? Uh, it's really difficult to say whether either minorities would have the same sense of being an outsider or they would just bring it from their perspective. Uh, but I can definitely say that one of the things, the problem with politics is that politics in itself, in its essence, is uh, what you would call traditional values that we associate with masculinity. Uh, politics in its essence is about the accumulation and employment of power. That's it. That's what it's always been. That's what it always will be. I was always amused when politicians would run campaigns saying, we'll have a new kind of politics. This will be new politics. It was like, you know what? I'm sorry. Politics has been the same for the last few thousand years. I really fail to see how you're going to change it. Uh, politics is about power and it's a very, and it's very competitive. Uh, for example, we've uh, been uh, brought up to learn that, you know, especially feminine style or generally we should seek leadership that is inclusive, that is win-win. That's not politics. Politics structurally is win-lose. There are 120 members of parliament in Israel, 120 members of Knesset. If there is room for me, then someone else didn't get in. And there's no way to sugarcoat it. I can't go to someone and say, we'll do this together because there's going to be a point where it's going to be between me and him or me and her. And, um, and one of the things, for example, that you see in politics, which is common to other minorities, is that women are considered to have the positions of women. So, for example, they'll say, okay, if you get in, she won't get in. So they tend to put women in direct competition with each other rather than assume that you'll take the place of another man. Wow. And that's also something that you see. Men can be feminist until it comes to their own political suicide. They're not going to be feminist to the point of endangering their own position. So in that sense, politics is really tough because by its very structure, it's not about inclusivity, it's not about feel good, it's not about win-win. And as a woman, you have to accept that those are the harsh realities of politics. Well, I love this view because it's really saying that women in politics is basically uh, not a contradiction, but you can't, basically there's no feminine leadership in politics. There cannot be feminine leadership in politics because it goes against the very essence of the definition of politics. So I love that. I think it's so true, but you speak about feminist, right? The feminism, the feminism yeah. movement, and I'll speak about you know how you connect this also to Zionism in the next question, um, but there is, you know, defending the woman's cause, which I believe is the definition of feminism. And there mm -hmm. is the way that you do it, right? The way that you're going to defend feminine, you know, the feminine cause. And very often, 
uh, people think that the way that feminists are defending this cause is a very masculine way because they're fighting and they're rebelling and they're against, and it's also about power. And so I know that you're, you, you say that you're a very strong feminist. So how do you, con you know, reconcile the two, like defending the feminine cause and at the same time doing it in a feminine leadership way? But that's exactly it. I mean, feminism is about rearranging the distribution of power so that women have power and that more women have more power. And again, there's no way around it. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I'm an open declarative feminist. So for oh. example, one of the funny things that happens, I don't know if it's funny, but it's one of the things that happens to Every woman politician, when she enters politics in Israel, I don't know if they do the same in other places, but you know, there'll always be like a microphone put in your face and they'll be like, are you a feminist? Wow. And almost all of the women politicians, and mind you, as I said, these are women who just went through brutal campaigns, are clearly competitive, feel comfortable with power, and yet the majority of them would say, look, I wouldn't feel comfortable calling myself a feminist. But then sometimes they would say, but do you believe in the equal right of men and women to pursue uh, uh, their opportunities? And they'll say, yes. And I would often listen to this and I think, then you're a feminist. I mean, this is what it is. But I've realized over the years, and this has to do with being a Zionist, and my Twitter handle says feminist, Zionist, atheist, yes. Exactly, so it's, yes. It's, it's in your face labels. And one of the things that I've come over the years to appreciate that it's actually important to use labels because it's the labels that uh, send a sense of confidence. When you're a woman, but you shy away from the title of feminist, you're already playing into the hands of those who want to undermine your confident, wow. your confidence. And non-confident women is already a step back. Wow. Uh, so for me, using the label, saying clearly I'm a feminist, you know, I was asked that when I became a member of parliament, I said clearly, yes, I'm a feminist. And you could see the journalists were like, oh, wow. Okay, we didn't like that. Um, so, yes, I use the labels because the labels connote confidence. And the very essence of feminism is for women to confidently take power. And if that's considered masculine, so be it. But that's what it is. Right. So it's very interesting because that was my next question. You're comparing feminism with Zionism. And I've heard you say something, but it's something that I've also, you know, uh, thought about before. So it really resonated with the collective unconscious, right? The collective unconscious of the Jewish people is to be a minority. The collective unconscious of the women is to be outsider or not to have the power. And I know that you compare both feminism and Zionism in a way that we have to stop uh, feeling not confident or, you know, apologizing for who we are and, you know, owning our power. And you also say something really true, which is today Zionism can be almost considered as, as an insult or as a toxic word, right? You can, you know, we, we see people protesting and saying Zionism equals fascism and all those things. And so, again, I'm trying to find the, the right balance between, you know, yes, defending our identity as, you know, the Jewish people, as women, and yes, you know, being proud of this and feeling confident exactly what you're saying, uh, but still, again, I'm going to go back to doing it in a feminine way because what, and again, I'm, I'm asking the question, I'm, I'm really happy to learn, but but it's it's really about, you know, it hasn't worked until now the the power way it hasn't worked and and we feel like there needs to be a balance between this power you know ego driven battle and where you bring something that is more in cooperation like you said in win win and this is starting to work the trend is going so is there any hope that we'll be able to fight those battle not the masculine way or you say no we have to go that way and there's no other choice at the moment I don't see any other choice because anything we're still in that world. So anytime we give ground, we lose. Uh, so for me, there's no balance. The only balance is to be completely out there, 
proud and confident. So, and, and you're saying it hasn't worked. I say that it has worked amazingly. Look at where women are today. I, I mean, I would not be, I'm sure you too, we would not be where we are without feminism. Things that we take for granted, our ownership of our bodies, of our life, to choose who we marry, when we marry, how to have kids, when to have kids, to have our own bank accounts, that's fairly recent, uh, to get education, to be able to vote, to be elected. We've come to take those things for granted, but all of these things did not happen without a fight and the good old style fight, the one that really goes against the establishment and demands power and doesn't give up until it gets it. Uh, the same with Zionism. At the end of the day, Zionism did work. It worked very well. And yes, it's true that a lot of Jews feel uncomfortable with the transition between the meek Talmud studying Jews of old to the militarized, uh, confident Israeli. Uh, I read a sentence this week from an author who said, Jews without guilt, Jews without angst, they're not really Jews. You know, the <laughs> transformation of Zionism, but it has worked. Uh, but it's true that a lot of people, women and Jews, but mostly outsiders, feel uncomfortable with this historical transformation in the role of women, in the role of Jews. Once we're at the table, we can bring what we have to the table. But all of our ideas, I mean, my ability to bring my outsider views to the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee would not have existed without generation of feminist fighters and certainly without Zionists. We would not have a committee, a Knesset or a state without that. So all of the, to even be in that position where I'm a woman, a Jewish woman sitting in the Foreign Defense and Defense Committee of the Knesset, of the sovereign state of the Jewish people, Without feminism, without Zionism, that particular moment could not have been possible. And that moment happened by generations of people fighting and employing good old power, especially when met with resistance. If you don't meet resistance, then you could do win-win. But when you meet resistance, which is what both feminism and Zionism have met, including in the toxification of uh, the titles, this is one of the ways in which it works by trying to undermine the confidence of Jews and women in using those adjectives. Uh, without fighting the resistance, we would have been brought back to our so-called proper place. Right. I, I love it because the, it, do you think that this is what we call post-Zionism or post-feminism? Is it is it related to, uh, you know, the way that we come back, meaning like there was a very big movement of women that were everyone was feminist. And then women came out and said, no, 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 I'm not feminist because of the reason that you mentioned. And is what you're offering maybe a, a new way to come back to the fight, uh, but from a different perspective? Is, is that something that we can call like that? Uh, I'm actually still calling it feminism. You know, in college, I studied art history. And at the time, everyone talked about postmodernism. And I remember we once met with the museum curator and he said, in truth, it's still modernism. I haven't seen anything, you know, that challenges uh, that is not modernism. The same with feminism. I mean, the fight is always about the next frontier. So, of course, we're not fighting right now about voting rights at least not most in most places. Uh, but in many, many countries, I mean, I can tell you when I read like UN reports about the status of women around the world, these are like my most depressing days because here we celebrate and we think post-feminism, but oh my, I mean, there is still so much, certainly around the world to even get to the position where women own their bodies and that they can marry who they want, when they want, have children when they want, have bank accounts, have financial independence. Uh, in the West, we're still struggling with equal pay, with uh, uh, sexual harassment, which is basically a form of violence against women when they enter the public sphere. It's basically another way to tell women you do not belong in these places, so we will use various forms of violence to show me what to show you what your real proper role is or your real proper place. We're still fighting those battles. So yes, it's always the next frontier. 
And one of the things that anti-feminism or anti-Zionism does is kind of say, hey, don't you have enough? Just be thankful. We gave you the vote. Enough. You know what? You want You want to be elected too? Uh, you want to... So, of course, it's always about the next frontier because we are dismantling power structures that have been in place for millennia. And it takes time. And it's exhausting. When I meet women... <laughs> And, and Jews, I mean, the, the overall experience is one of exhaustion. Yeah. It's like, does it never end? We want to believe in post-feminism. We want to believe in post-Zionism. But no, the world has not yet completely adjusted to the idea of women with power, to the idea with Jews with power, which is why we need to keep fighting still. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that from hearing from you also, the exhaustion is also fighting with the same people that should be convinced already, right? It's convincing women or convincing Jews of their right to be confident and to have the power. And I think it's sometimes they're even the, their worst enemy uh, in that in that battle. So uh, so for sure, no, I, I definitely I thank you because this is a new perspective. Uh, that uh, that I'm actually listening from you and hearing from you. And, and I know that we have people listening here and we have comments. Unfortunately, I don't see uh, the names, but we have people that say that was the identity of the ancient Jewish people to begin with. We are reclaiming mm -hmm. that identity. So people are really agreeing with what you're saying. With one last question, I know you have to go at 625 and we will let you go on time. Uh, you, you have have experience in the political arena and outside as an author, as a leader. Um, do you think that politics is maybe not the only way, but the best way to have a real impact on the people? Or do you think that there are other ways to have an impact? Uh, there are certainly other ways. And politics is actually very, very uh, elusive because when you're in politics, you feel, OK, now I'm in the center of power. Now I'm going to be in a place of influence. I've arrived. And yet I can share with you my experience. The first time I arrived in committees, I was like, okay, I'm here on the finance committee. Let's debate finance. Okay. And then somewhere through the debates, I'm beginning to feel the things were already closed behind the deals were already made. I'm beginning to sense that I'm sitting in the committee, but this is not where the decisions are really being made. Decisions were already made before and the committee is more of a performance. So I found myself in politics often chasing, where is the seat of power? Where do decisions get done? And, and I think it's elusive because even when you're in it, there's so many pressures that, I mean, it's never just this notion of like, I come in, I say, there, let there be light and there's light. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I've had to contend with is that politics as well as other pursuits, such as what, what I do now, writing and speaking, they each have their some of the ability to influence and some things that are not. So, for example, once I left politics, I compared it to kind of an ancient Greek curse. I thought, OK, it's like the Greek gods. When you enter politics, the Greek gods tell you this. They'll tell you, we'll give you a megaphone, which means politics does give you an elevated platform. That's true. Your voice will be heard uh, far and above other voices of other people. But, and this is the curse, nothing that you say into the megaphone will have any resemblance to what comes out of the megaphone. Now, do you want that elevated platform? And this for me was the most difficult thing in politics. I'm a thinking person. I'm a, I, I write, words matter to me. The ability to craft a thought, right? Much of our discussion now was about words and how they matter. Uh, these are critical things to me. It was really difficult for me in politics to realize how mangled my thoughts came out once they were out there in the media. Um, how, you know, and, and you know, a, a lot of people today tell me, oh, a not, uh, we wish you were back in politics. And I was like, you know what? I've been in politics to know that the day that I go back into politics, you'll be like, Damn, what happened to her? She seemed so smart and decent. Politics ruined her. Because once you enter there and everything through the megaphone gets mangled, you appear to be weird or stupid or or not knowing where you are. So uh, 
this this is the package of politics and everyone every time that i feel this pull of going back in i remind myself of this ancient greek curse and i ask myself whether i want it whether it's right for me and most of the times my conclusion is no i'm much better off with a less elevated platform but at least i'm in control of my words and my thoughts and what goes out out to the world well amazing well we are happy that you did have this this time in politics so that we can invite you uh, for this woman in politics but my uh, gut feeling here is that we're going to invite you for much more uh, than uh, just women in politics thank you so much Dr. Ville, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your perspective on things. We have comments. You're more than welcome to come and see them if you want after. I know you have to go at 625. Thank you for your time and thank you so much for participating in this Women in Politics special series interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank bye, you for bye, this initiative. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.